Okay, Hugh, you've left a, a, a great challenge to why. Why it matters to God. So my job, whatever it may be in leadership, is about redeeming. Okay. God's, God's got an agenda for this, okay. this he does. career. He does for a fact. He does for a fact. Um, it's interesting, the why piece, I think, is one of the most powerful pieces. Um, there's an old, old story. Uh, it's actually, it's a study that was done probably 50 or 60 years ago. But they took two construction teams. Actually, these guys were laborers, common laborers. And one of them, they took up to a swamp and said, we've got to dig this ditch five miles long, drain this swamp because the swamp is producing mosquitoes and disease and everything. And so they started. They were getting paid $2 an hour, or whatever it was back then. The other group, they said, they took them to a place and said, we want you to dig a ditch a mile long, then we want you to go back, fill it in, dig it again, fill it in, getting paid the same amount. Four months later, they came back, and guess what happened? Almost the entire crew that started digging the ditch to drain the swamp were still working. But the crew that was digging the ditch to fill it in, digging it, almost all of them had quit, even though they were getting paid the same amount. Why is that? The why is because there was no why to what they were doing. So as Christians, if we're to sustain what God wants us to do, we've got to get back to this why. And we're doing a lot of writing about this whole idea of flourishing. Flourishing is one of the great themes in both the Old Testament and New Testament. It weaves its way through all the things that you read, all the stories you read. It's about God's intent for his creation to flourish. Now, we know sin came into the world, and that flourishing became more and more difficult, right? But I think that if we understand what the Scripture says to us, and we understand the call it has on our life in those four separate areas, both vocation, community, family, and the church, that as we do what God's called us to do, and we each bring our different resources together, once again, I talked about interdependence. Fascinating thing, we're all made in the image of God, so we're all the same at that level, right? But we're all very different. I have economists named Ann Bradley that uh, works for her. She got a PhD in economics, and she's taught me a lot about economics in the last three years. One of the things she says, economists have something they call comparative advantage, and that we all have comparative advantage. That means even though we're all the same, we're all made in God's image, we're all very different in that we've got different passions, different gifts, and it's only when we come together and use those can we do more than what we can do by ourselves. See, flourishing cannot be done by yourself. You can't go flourish by yourself. Stewardship can only be done in community, right? The illustration she uses all the time is the, remember this, the uh, movie Castaway with, with uh, Tom Hanks, right? Goes to this beautiful desert island and crashes there and, you know, there's plenty of water, plenty of food. I mean, this is a place we would go for vacation, right? But does he flourish? Why? No, he doesn't. Why? Because he's by himself. So it's just not good for man to be alone. We have to come together in community to do what God wants us to do. This is the interdependence. So I know you're asking me hard questions. I'll keep talking. I'll stop you <laughs> even know that. I watch, I watch what you did to, okay. to Mr. Green. <laughs> okay. okay, Hugh, okay. Let, let's, because there is a giant experiment going on right yes. now yes. about human yes. flourishing in yes. America, yes. and it's the $15 movement. Yes, yes, very much so. And, and I'm not an economist, so I can't really speak to that like my economist would, but I'll tell you what she would say if she was here. Okay, tell us so, about so, what so, we should so do with this movement. She would say that it's symptomatic of something even worse that's happening. In fact, I was talking to somebody about this earlier. Government, particularly politicians, and unfortunately on, on both sides, because you can't really just throw one party under the bus. Both sides are bad. They all have such a short-term vision. It's all about trying the next election cycle and getting there. Nobody thinks long time. And in fact, that disease is filtered down to big corporations. It's all about the next cycle. The only people who are really thinking long-term in the country now are small business owners like you, because you have to. And it's brought this disease that we'll do anything we can just to get votes. So these guys, they don't really care if the $16 or whatever the, the quote, livable wage is. They don't really care if it works or not. All they want to do is get votes. So it helps them address a certain group of people. And I think the problem is that so many of these politicians have not a clue about business. They're professional politicians. They've never, you know... I mean, I, I bet almost everyone in this room has had a sleepless night. I know I've had many, some since I started the Institute. When, when, when you've laid in bed awake thinking, how am I going to make payroll this week? None of these professional politicians have ever done that. 
They don't know what it's like to come in and work and build a company. It, you know, it's, they just want to give freebies out because it gives them votes. So, so I think it's, it's endemic of a bigger problem in the country. And what are we going to do, though, now that social media has let this yeah, out yeah, of the bag? Yeah. Like it's, an, it's caught on yep. 15 for yep. 15. And there is a sense that the ordinary guy working in the fast yep. food says, that will give me flourishing. Yep, yep. That wage will make yep, me flourish. Yep. Well, I think we've, we've got to educate people and understand that the bottom rung of the ladder, I mean, the, the wage scale is a ladder. It's not a box. You're not trapped in there. You know, you go take an entry-level job to learn something, to learn to improve yourself, to make yourself better, to go up to the next lot. I mean, it's interesting. I saw some statistics the other day. Most people that get minimum wage, I mean, it's a huge amount, like 75% or something like that, are teenagers. So I work part-time. So the whole thing is really just kind of made up, and it gets the press. And, you know, and once again, these politicians want to make everybody think that they're their hero and they're going to take care of them. I mean, what do you hear them all say? I'm going to take care of you. I don't want them taking care of me. I don't know about you. <laughs> okay, let's, let's talk about taking care of me on yeah. the other side yeah. of the okay. scale. Okay. okay, so what should be the biblical approach towards CEO compensation? Well, and that's another good question. You know, you hear all this back and forth. Um, as one politician said, what does it matter? I mean, really, what does the difference it make? I mean, you should get paid what you're worth, and the market sets both at the bottom and at the top what you're worth. Now, I think there's a problem with some cronyism and, and, and some of that in some of these bigger corporations where if you look at their boards, they're all their friends, and, and they vote higher wages for their work. So that's a problem, and the cronyism in particularly in a larger corporate, I mean, there's not a Fortune 500 company today that's not involved in cronyism. Let's face it. To define cronyism. Okay, they're going in, they're lobbying for the government to give them special privileges. They can do things that you guys can never do. And that's unfair. We need to make the playing field much more level. Um, but once again, it gets back to the politicians and the power and the power broking, brokering and everybody's giving people benefits. Um, particularly people who donate more to certain causes, uh, political so causes. So you wouldn't say there's no blanket policy like nope. we s that, that should say this no. is where a limit no. gets drawn? No, absolutely it's just, not. It, that's freedom. It should, the free market should dictate what people get paid. Because if that was really true, and of course the free market, is, it, 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 we don't really have a free market today, but, which is another problem. The reality, I think, is we need less government interference. If the government would get their hands out of what you guys are trying to do, and there were less regulations, the economy would take off like a rocket. <laughs> you also do know, I do know that the Institute studies um, the economic material of the political yes. left. Yes, what we have do. you learned from we that? Do. Well, it's interesting. Um, one thing, I think the political left, particularly the Christian political left, has had a huge influence on the church a negative influence, I'd say, in the last, particularly the last so? 30, 40 years. There was a poll recently done that said 66% of evangelical Christians do not believe that the tenets of free market capitalism have anything at all in common with the tenets of Christianity. That's pretty sad, and it's a lie. I think I can make a sound argument that capitalism as we know it today uh, springs up out of the fertile ground plowed by the, the theologians like Luther and, and Calvin during the Reformation. And literally the idea of the Protestant work ethic absolutely revolutionized Europe, came across in the United States, built the United States. Everybody wants to deny that, but it's true. Fascinating thing, there's a, a, one of my favorite historians, he's not a Christian, he's an agnostic, a guy named Niall Ferguson. He wrote a book several years ago called Why the Best Was, I think it's Why the West is better than the rest, or something like that. He said, Western civilization has been the best civilization ever in the history of the world because it had six killer apps, he used the computer technology, that no other civilization ever had. And the interesting thing, you know what one of those six killer apps was? And this is coming from a non-Christian who's just observing what happened. It was the Protestant work ethic. He said it built Europe, came across the United States, it built, uh, built the United States after building Europe. He says, you can't find any trace of it in Europe anymore. He says, you can barely find a trace of it in the United States. But then he says something really weird, and I'm not sure this is true, but it's, it's interesting, so I'll throw it out. Um, he says, it's still alive and well. You know where? In China. 
And he says, the rise of capitalism in China mirrors the rise in Christianity. Well, that's very interesting. That's the church very is growing in yeah, China. Yeah. Okay, we're getting a challenge question here from the floor, okay. which we love your questions. Well, it'll be easier than your two questions, two two for sure. 2333, three. that's all you got to text, 22333. Three, three, three. What advice can you give for someone in an industry that doesn't seem to do much for yeah, human yeah. flourishing? Here's what you have to understand, is that everything you do is important to God. There's intrinsic value in your work, whatever that may be, no matter how mundane that is. See, if this is what, if I'm, what I'm talking about doesn't work for the guy, only works for the CEO, and doesn't work for the guy that's on the assembly line putting six screws in a widget over and over again, because that's what God's called him to do, then it doesn't work for anybody. But what you have to see, once again, is the bigger picture. And this is what we need to learn how to paint. We need to paint the bigger picture. That what he's doing by putting those screws in that widget, he's part of a community that's building something that will help bring about flourishing. So it's hard for him to connect the dots sometimes with what he does every day. And there are a lot of people, it's hard for you to connect the dots with a lot of things that you do that seem very mundane, right? But there's intrinsic value in everything that you do if you're doing it for God's glory. And that's the piece we have to understand. And, 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 I, and I can prove this, I think, by the scripture. If you look at, at Genesis 2.15, it says, God took Adam and put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it. That was before the fall. So he wasn't doing any evangelism in the garden. He was just doing work. There was intrinsic value to God to the work that Adam did, no matter how insignificant it might have seemed to Adam, because God could see the bigger picture. That's the picture we have to paint for people. We have to paint that for the people at workforce. We have to paint that for our vendors. We have to say, look, we're all doing this together to produce things that bring about flourishing. And you may just play a very small piece of it, and the piece may be so small that you may not see it immediately. That's the other problem, right? It may take longer for it to come to fruition, but we have to hang in there till it does. Are there some professions, some parts of, of culture that you're looking at and saying, there's so much wasted flourishing there? Yeah, I mean, What, what the board. would be an area that would The biggest one, you? the church. I hate to say that, but I think we're missing opportunities in the church to really help people understand what they've been called to do. I, we have a fantastic pastor, and he preached a sermon the other day about, um, about um, oh my, how can I say this in a nice way? Um, Just, <laughs> okay. you're amongst, you're amongst, yeah, yeah, amongst friends, okay, and, and it's being recorded too, you'll probably get back to him. But he basically <laughs> preached a sermon about being content. And for 30 minutes, we, we heard about how you have to go be content, and you, you know, so I walked out, and I said, okay, Pastor, you just told me for 30 minutes I have to be content. Now I'm going to go to work tomorrow. Does that mean I don't work hard to win that job, to compete in the marketplace? He looked at me and goes, well, no, that's not exactly what I'm asking. Well, that's what I heard for 30 minutes. <laughs> and see, I think we've got to teach pastors. I ran a seminary for seven years, and, and I quit because I was doing such a bad job because I couldn't get pastors <laughs> interested. I got frustrated because I couldn't get them interested in this whole thing about faith and work. They just want to do church stuff, right? And see, what they don't get is that when we're the church gathered on Sunday, the purpose of the church gathered is to equip the saints for service. Where does that service happen? It doesn't happen in the church. It happens out in the community when we're the church scattered. I think that's the message that we somehow need to just, you know, kind of gently bring our pastors along to and make them understand they're training up the saints for service, and that service doesn't necessarily take place in the church. Uh, now, I'm a churchman. Don't get me wrong. I, I believe in the church more than anything. But I think the biggest opportunity we have is to get back in the church and make the church a place that equips the saints to go out into the world and really be salt and light and make a difference. And if we can do that, we can get back to where we were 100 years ago, and we will start having a tremendous effect on the um, on everything. Let me, let me tell you one interesting thing I was just reading recently. Talked to a guy, he said, you know, you, we could just get 20% of the country to be committed Christians. We could change this world. I said, no, you don't. You don't have to have that. There's a social science uh, called, um, I think what's called, it's called minority influence. And what that says is that a minority as small as 1% can have a radical impact on the bigger group. And then it goes on and talks about what you have to do to do that. The one of the most interesting things is you have to be perceived as a positive influence from the rest of the culture. Now, what's the problem with the church today? We're known for what we're against, not what we're for. 
So if you don't hear anything else I said today, go out and let's change that. Let's be a positive force for good in our communities, in our churches, in our businesses. Let's let people say, you know, I know he's a Christian. I don't necessarily believe all that stuff. But if he wasn't here, this would not be as good a place as it would be. If, the community, if, if your business was not in your community, would people say the community is, has, has lost something because they're not here? That's what we need to be able to go do. We talked this weekend already about um, how very different the millennial generation yes. is. They yes. came into the workplace yep. with a different set of skills. The, the owners right. weren't even there when, con when the internet was, right. was on. What, what, what advice have you got for the whole millennial yeah. ethic? Yeah, and, you know, and, and I have an office one. We have 23 people at, at the uh, Institute, and I think you know, I know, 18 of them are millennials. Um, so I work with them all the time. I think the biggest advice you can give to them is, look, you don't have to do it all the first year. See, they've been told a lie. It's partly our fault because we've told it to them. We've told them you can be anything you want to be, and we've told them you can be the best in the world. <laughs> those, are, those are two big lies, and we've really set them up for failure because a lot of millennials believe they haven't made their first $2 million. By the time they're 28, they're a failure, right? And the reality is most of us have to do two or three jobs to really learn what we're good at. I, I spoke the other day at a home, big homeschool conference and told them this is what I wish somebody had told me when I was coming out of college. That you don't have to, first of all, there's no perfect job. That's, they're all looking for the perfect job. I hate to tell them there's no perfect job. I've got a really good job because I created it, but uh, it's still not perfect. I still have to do things I don't like to do. And I, I, and I hired a CEO the other day so I could do less of what I don't like to do. And he yells at me more than anybody else in the company does. <laughs> so it really hasn't worked out too good for me. But, um, but there are no perfect jobs. That's the first thing I would tell them. The second is understand that you're going to have to work at probably two or three different jobs to really understand what God's gifted you to do. Because most of us don't. I mean, it took, I was 60, 60. I'm 62 now. I was 60 before I really figured it out. And some people say I haven't figured it out yet. But uh, regardless, I think that's the two big things that I would tell them. Is first, a no perfect job. Second, go find some jobs to learn about who God's made you to be, how he's gifted you, and how he wants you to make a difference long term of where he's put you. And how does coaching work for you in the, uh, in, in the whole issue um, of human flourishing? Yeah, I was very convicted by the, the, uh, the talk earlier. I'm probably not a very good coach, um, and, um, but I think it is important. I think it's real important. And, and so... People say, uh, <laughs> people say, I really don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can say type A personality, all that kind of stuff. I'm an ENFP, and I wander around, and I, I have all these crazy ideas. And they say one of the problems with our company is you've got so many ideas for you, we can't get any of them done. So, um, um, yeah, so it's um, coaching is a good thing. Just okay. need to find somebody good to come do it. <laughs> awesome. Mr. Hugh Welchel, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.